You're joining All Things College and Career for in-depth stories and advice with your hosts, Meg Gary and Bobby Ryan, owners of Academic and Career Advising Services. Hello, everyone. Meg and I have completed Season 3, but we thought it'd be fun to put together a little recap of some of the amazing career tips we have received from our guests. This is just a small sample, as all of our guests have contributed tons of great advice, content, and tips for our listeners. If we had the time, we'd go through and grab sound bites from all our guests, but we don't. (laughs) However, if you're looking for some inspiration, please visit our website, All Things College and Career, atcandc.com, and check out all of the various careers we have covered and guests we have had on that are true inspirations and have lots to offer college and career seekers. So we hope you enjoy this compilation of incredibly useful information from 10 of our guests. Our first guest is Dr. Don Graham, author of Switchers, How Smart Professionals Change Careers and See Success. She is the host of the very popular call-in show, Career Talk on Sirius XM Radio, the career director for the Executive MBA program at the Wharton School, a LinkedIn instructor, and a licensed psychologist. First, Dr. Don gives a tip on what question to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out what career you want to pursue. Say, you know, we often ask young people, what do you want to do? What do you think you want to do? Even even mid-stage career, what do you want to do? And I would say we need to start shifting that and start saying, what problems do you want to solve? Because oh. when you ask the question that way, I think people can can hone in on a better answer that's not tied to a title or an industry that, you know, where they're making assumptions about what it would be like. But if you say, what problems do you want to solve? That's when people come to life and start saying, you know, this climate change is something that really interests me and I want to get involved in that. Next, Dr. Don shares some great networking tips in the data, but the key message is we don't have to go out and network with strangers. If we just have a different conversation with the people already in our lives yes. um, about our goals, then doors are going to open up. And I think I use the story about just having to talk to my brother about this company I wanted to speak at. And he knew in Utah, somebody who knew the head of the organization and, you know, and six months never later, would have giving him that oh. talk. Right. Yeah, you I never I would never. have imagined. Yeah, yeah, your brother of all people. That's yeah. I, love <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think, oh, we must know a lot of the same people. But the fact is, we don't have these conversations. You know, we barbecue with our neighbors or we go to our book club or, or yoga or whatever it is we're doing or, or even just our, our friends and family. And we don't talk about our goals. If we talk about work, it's usually, oh, you know, my job stinks or I have to yeah, do right, this project. Right. I'm exhausted. When, exactly. <laughs> and that's fine. But if you have a goal and you say, you know, I'm really interested in getting into tech. I would bet that most people you talk to will have a suggestion or an idea or a contact. And and it really is as simple as that. And we overlook those opportunities every single day with the people we are already interacting with. So it doesn't take any extra time. It just takes a tweak in the conversations we're already having talking to the people you know and ensuring they know your goals. I mean, that is one of the easiest. But if I if I had to say one of the best things is to make networking a regular part of your life without expectation. And, and what I mean by that is a lot of people say, I don't have time or and I'm an introvert and I don't feel comfortable. And I'm an introvert and I will say, yeah, it, sometimes I have to kind of right. put it on my calendar and force myself. But if, when you make this a regular part of your life, by, for example, if you're going to an event, say, I'm going to sit next to somebody new, or you are in a yoga class, and you're saying, I'm going to actually introduce myself to somebody. Right. My guest on, on Career Talk next week, I met in a dressing room. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, I mean, just, and to recognize that these opportunities are everywhere, and sometimes it's just about asking a question or starting a conversation without expectation, and the people you meet maybe help you now, maybe help you five years from now, maybe help you never, but but when you start making it a regular process, just saying, hey, I'm going to be curious and learn something about this person, you know, you're going to be surprised at how that comes back to open up your options in all areas of your life. Here, Dr. Don talks about two very important things to do while still in college. 
when I was at Seton Hall, I didn't even realize there was something like a career center. I had no idea. Hmm. And, you know, in hindsight, we actually, you know, Seton Hall, I think, has four, maybe more now. So one of the things I would say is that if you're in a college or a university, don't wait. It doesn't matter if you just started or if you're just starting your sophomore year. Don't wait because these centers are built to help you at every step of the way and a lot of people like myself either don't know they exist or don't know how they can use them or they wait till their senior year and they go now and now's the time but I would say get started early think about internships think about ways to build concrete experience don't make the mistake that I did and, and find out what your campus offers and take advantage of it because the fact is your career is for life you have to engage that starting now, especially if you're not sure what you want to do, or especially if you're in a degree program that you're not sure what the options are. And I would say get to know your professors, get to know your yeah. faculty. I'm actually still in touch with my undergrad advisor. I've done a number of presentations at Johns Hopkins over the wow. last year on my book. I'm still in touch with my advisor there and, of course, mm -hmm. my doctoral advisor because, you know, a lot of people go through school and they kind of just show up for class and leave, but you don't understand until maybe later in your life the wealth of knowledge and connections that are right at your door. <laughs> Dr. Don shares with us the most important thing to get across in an interview. So I would say that recognize what matters to the hiring manager. And it's really three things, skills, fit, and motivation. And I would say motivation is often the most important and usually candidates prepare the least for this question. And hmm. that question comes across as, why are you interested in this job or why are you interested in this company or why are you looking for a job right now? It could come across in many forms or fashion, but the, the point is why are you sitting here in front of me interviewing? Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people have an underwhelming answer along the lines of, oh, I'm really passionate about this industry or your company's cutting edge. And, and you know, they give kind of a canned answer. And I think and that's a mis <laughs> mistake. Right? Yeah. Well, not only does it tell them nothing, but I would go so far as to say that you're going to get hired on the motivation question because by the time you're in an interview, they know you have the skills. They wouldn't be wasting the time if, if you didn't have the skills. They probably also know you're a fit because especially if you've been referred, you know, this is a second interview. But now it comes down to why should I hire you? And, you know, this is about why do you want to be here? Because the fact is I can hire somebody great who is going to punch the clock not go above and beyond and, you know, do the bare minimum. And maybe that person is the exact experience I'm looking for. But especially as a switcher, that motivation question is your opportunity to demonstrate that you've already committed to this field in some way. So, you know, I've spent the last two years really learning about this industry and volunteering and the skills I bring are and, and showing them that you've made a commitment and how this fits into your career overall. And that's what somebody wants to hire. They want to hire somebody with fire right now uh, they want to hire somebody who's like driven and hungry mm -hmm. and so it doesn't matter necessarily if you don't have the perfect background if you can convince them that that this is where you are meant to be and you're going to give it your all and you're going to contribute that could put you over the edge I think it's a really important thing to focus on when you're prepping for the interview our next amazing career tip comes from Austin Belsack Austin provides outstanding content for career searchers. Through his business, Cultivate a Culture, his podcast, The Dream Job System, and through his many content-rich posts on LinkedIn. Austin talks here about the best way to get in the door of your target company using VVP. You will learn what that is and how to make it work for you right now with Austin. When I was younger, I played some sports and, and my parents would, you know, take me to soccer tryouts or basketball tryouts. And we didn't show up with an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that said, you know, hey, Austin scored three goals last year and has a really good <laughs> left foot corner kick, you know, written in Times New Roman font, right? Like <laughs> right. I, I went out there and I did it. And right. we, we never do that for the job, which makes, you know, absolutely no sense to me. And, and that was one of the most frustrating things for me because so many job seekers, I hear them them say, well, you know, if someone would just give me a chance, I know that I can do this. And companies just aren't in the business to give people a chance. They haven't found a way to effectively let people try out. And that can seem like a bummer. But if we actually flip it on its head, 
if we create our own way to try out through something that I call a value validation project, which we can talk about, we actually give ourselves the ability to, to set ourselves apart from everybody else. So the fact that everybody's kind of still playing the same game of tweak your resume and apply online, if we step outside that box and find a creative way to illustrate our value, uh, that is going to be you know so much more effective. And so how do we solve for that? Well, if we go and do some research on the company, if we listen to maybe some of their earnings calls or go do some research on their financials, if they're public, um, if they're private, maybe if we go listen to some interviews with executives, or maybe we go survey their customers and, and see what some of the needs are. We do some of that research and we look for areas of opportunity that that are relevant to the role that we're stepping into. And then we create a little bit of a pitch that speaks to those things. So we can essentially say, hey, I went and did some research on your company. I went and did some research on the specific role. And here are some things that I found. And then here is why my background is sort of supporting evidence for you know these ideas. Here's why I'm qualified to execute on them. Here's why I'm the right person for the job. If we do that, we're essentially trying out for the role almost. But even if it's short of that, we're at least finding ways to align our value that is you know, directly applicable to this specific role versus hoping that somebody looks at a resume bullet and can extrapolate the, the value that we're trying to convey there. Our next guest is Mac Pritchard, founder of MaxList, the premier job board and career hub for the Pacific Northwest and author of Land Your Dream Job Anywhere, which is an amazing book and a great read. Also, he is the host of the weekly career advice podcast, Find Your Dream Job, which Meg and I listen to all the time, and we encourage you guys to do the same. First, we asked Mac, what is the hidden job market? These are the jobs that are filled by word of mouth. They usually are, are never posted anywhere, or if they are, it's just for a very limited time. There are estimates out there that as many as 40 to 80% of all positions uh, are never publicly advertised. Nobody knows but the point is, you've got to recognize that because that's how the system works. And the reason it happens is because hiring managers want to manage risk. And so they look to people they've worked with in the past when they're thinking about candidates, or they look for recommendations from people they know and trust. And if you recognize that that's how the system works, then you can make the system work for you. Most people, though, because often they don't know any better, they spend 100% of their time on job boards. And, uh, and so they're, they may be seeing only you know, 20 to 60% of the jobs out there. And the other thing that happens is the people who are good at finding these so-called hidden jobs, and they're hiding in plain sight, you can't find them. Uh, they, the people who do learn how to do informational interviews, how to volunteer strategically, how to network, and, and so that's why it's so important to learn job hunting skills. The folks who spend 100% or maybe 90% of their time on the job boards, they spend a lot of time filling out applications and they never hear back. And when you're job hunting, relationships are so important and you've got to really invest time in them. So I, I would recommend, I run a job board and I'll tell you, uh, if you're spending more than 30 or 40% of your job hunting time looking at my job board, you're going to have a frustrating job search. Uh, you really need to step away from the computer and get good at job hunting skills like informational interviews, like networking, and, and invest in things like net volunteering. Matt talks next about the tips and tricks of the informational interview. Introductions are always best. So I would recommend people start with their own network. And again, I think there are two ways you can approach this. One is you've done your goal setting work. You know this is the position you want. You've made a short list of companies that interest you, maybe 15 or 25 firms. And then you can use informational interviews to talk to people inside those organizations about the opportunities that interest you and use those uh, meetings to get clear about the needs of employers who offer the jobs you want and ask for insights into opportunities that might be coming up as well as introductions to the people in the company. The second way, if you are, are still doing your career setting work and you say have come up with a list of two or three jobs, different jobs that interest you, but you're not sure which one, informational interviews are a great way to, to talk to people who have those jobs, find out what a typical day is like, what's rewarding about the positions, what, what's challenging, and get feedback about your own prospects as a candidate. 
And when you have those conversations, say you're considering three different goals. My experience has been that you figure out pretty quickly after having five or 10 of those meetings, which goal you're most excited about. And the other two will fall off the list. And then with that clarity, you can invest, you can actually move ahead in your search and continue to build your network and find out about opportunities that may never be advertised. Matt comments about what if they don't respond when you request an informational interview? Often when people don't respond, it's because we aren't very specific in making our requests. And, you know, we've talked about the importance of having clear goals when going out and seeking informational interviews. And I think once you know what those goals are in the companies, then you can look within your network and find people who are in those positions and approach them. But you've got to be clear about what it is you want. So often people send notes saying, could we get together for coffee or could I pick your brain? And it's well-intentioned. But the recipient of a message like that might think, well, am I going to have to leave the building? Is this going to be like an hour? And what's our agenda? And it is a business meeting. And if you're calling it, you're in charge. And as with any business meeting, you've got to run it and you've got to have a clear sense of your agenda and what the outcomes are that you want. Here, Max shares his views on networking. Networking is about helping others. And it's about giving to others without any expectation of of receiving anything in return. You're right. The popular image that comes to mind when people hear the word networking is the airport holiday inn function room. And there's some guy or lady walking around the room and she thinks success or he does uh, is collecting as many business cards as possible. But uh, what do you do with all those cards when you get back? You're better served by having a couple of conversations and asking lots of questions and listening and thinking about what you could do for others. And it's not just going to events. It's saying yes when people ask ask for informational interviews. Uh, It's about volunteering for in your community, whether it's for a cause you care about or perhaps the the events committee for the, the professional association in your field. Yeah, it's about service. When you think about network and how it can help your career, you do want to be thoughtful about it. And Often people say to me, if I could just meet the people at this company or at this organization, often those people are leaders in their field and they are involved in the local chapter of the relevant professional association. So they're at the monthly luncheon program. They're serving on the board or committee of the chapter. And you shouldn't volunteer just to meet these people, but you will meet them if you uh, sign up if you work in public relations for your local Public Relations Society of America chapter and agree to run the lunch program. Up next is Rich Feller, past president of the National Career and Development Association, NCDA, professor and university distinguished teaching scholar at Colorado State University, and creator of many tools to help in career fulfillment, such as Use Science, One Life Tools, and Conversations Matter. Rich is a nationally certified career counselor and an international speaker. Here we ask Rich for his best tips for job seekers in 2021. Well, for job seekers, we'll look at a couple levels. For college students or people getting into college, uh, the next crisis we're going to hear about is the difficulty of college graduates getting jobs that match their investments. And how do college students without much experience navigate the few jobs they're going to find. It's really a crisis. And Jeff Salingo and many others are talking about it. So I think we talk about advice for different kind of job seekers. For high school students, I would say this. Consider making sure you get experiential learning as best you can so that you can tell a story for entry-level work that just basically says, I've done something and what I've learned allows me to do it better. Second part is what skills are you going to learn in regardless to whatever course you take or whatever college experience you take, because we now live in a skills-biased economy. So I think people should focus less on their college degree and it meaning something. It's really translating it to what skills it gave you. And every professor should be real nervous and be saying, how do I translate the course I'm teaching into skills? Because that's the new commodity. Returning adults or anybody 30 plus, I think If you haven't been learning during this COVID experience, your digital skills, that's a really bad mark because this is really the new measure of what's been happening during COVID. Are you learning tech and digital skills? Because if you're not, we probably can find cheaper people who are more current than those skills. And for the 50 plus, I would say it's um, really rethinking what's the urgency you have, I mean, to pay the bills, or is it time to really look at reconstructing your own life purpose and finishing strong? 
So I answer that question, I think, according to the populations with some very bad stereotypes included. We next get into with Rich, what is it that career service providers can be doing to be more effective and more impactful in helping people with their careers? The key question that the three of us should probably get in a whiteboard for a couple of days and try to figure this out, but I've tried to make a difference there by, uh, if you know Dick Nodell's work, I've taken over his training program and do it for North America now, the job career transition certificate, coaching certificate. And I've thought about this because we start our class this way. And a couple of things I would say today, I get real simple terms. There's really four reasons people come to us. And the first is to figure out, you know, I need a job. And we have to understand that a job is nothing more than a problem to be solved. Get away from the title, look for, work for problems and work on solving them. The second re- reason people come to us is they really seek to find their purpose and meaning. So paying attention to purpose and meaning is critical, and we have some tools that help with that. Third part is they want a new start. They've gone through a divorce or got hurt or they're retiring. It's really, they want to write a second story. And see, we all get to write our first story up to this moment. And that really is our past. But right now we get to write a second story. You only get a second story. So when people have that mindset, I can write a second story. I think that's why they come to us. And the last one is how do I transition to what's next possibilities for me? So I try to say those are four reasons people come to us for help. It's really problems to be solved or jobs. I'm seeking my purpose and meaning. I want a new start or a second story, and I want to transition to what's next possibilities. So with that framework, I think we can all could define our work pretty nicely because it's fairly concrete. The outcomes, I think, why people come to us, I think they come to us because they want us to identify their hidden assets. And we can do that by having them tell stories and getting in the flesh at what they do. Because if you can tell your hidden assets and know what they are, you can really promote yourself better. The other part is the feedback part or what are my blind spots? Let me build enough trust with you so that we can talk about the blind spots we, you have so you can then learn what you need to develop to get where you want to go. So hidden assets and blind spots are a big part of it. Another part, I think, is really how do you honor differences so that The three of us all have wonderful differences, but let's honor them because that's going to differentiate how we do different tasks and honoring differences is a big part of it. And I think the other part is we have not talked in society about the power of social capital and we're afraid to because it's about classism, but we have to get people to look at who do they know, how do they get contacts, who leads them to opportunities, who has the right and privileged information, how do we pay attention to social capital? So those are some things I think we as a field, a profession could talk about. And maybe you've heard of this before, because I think I can't predict what the jobs will be. I can't predict what education needed, but I can predict one thing, that if we had a mindset, which we call heroic G, the mindset really allows us to help our children and me at my age navigate complexity because it's really given me power to understand what's going on. And heroic G stands for H is hope, E is self-efficacy, R is resilience, O is optimism, I is intentional exploration, and C is clarity and curiosity. And, and each one of those should be defined in a different article or I've written or whatever. But if I have those, I can navigate if I get cancer. I can navigate if I lose my partner. I can navigate it when I become an empty nester. I can navigate if I'm unemployed. It gives me some ways to have a mindset that's moving forward. And Carol Dweck really helped all of us to finally publicize the notion about not being fixed, but being growth. So we call it heroic G mindset. And that's a key part. And if it's helpful, I've done some writing on that. But that gives me the most confidence that I can uh, have a voice and self-advocate for myself. Justin Nguyen is our next guest. Justin is the host of Declassified College Podcast, an iTunes Top 100 podcast, and the ultimate guide to navigating college using what he calls cheat codes, which are basically amazing tips to kill it in college and beyond. So here, Justin shares with us just how to land an internship. Yeah. So I think only one out of the five actually came from an application. And this is where I started to really figure out these sort of cheat codes when it comes to um, surviving college. So before we get into the internships, I tried to apply to like 50 plus. Um, I believe this was my sophomore year and I was applying because that was the next thing that you were supposed to do as a college student. Had a near 4.0 GPA, had uh, like joined all the clubs, did everything that I was supposed to, got my resume critiqued, all that. 
applied to 50, didn't even get a call back. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Like I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. And I'm like putting in the effort to get them. And what I realized was the networking side. I didn't have the networking side. My, both my parents, like I said, were Vietnamese refugees. My dad never went to college. My mom did, and, but she's in computer science. So her network is much smaller because she's a little bit more introverted. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. So I go back up to Connecticut for the summer because my girlfriend's up there and also my friends. And I tried to always go back up to Connecticut just because I want to see my friends during the summer. And I look on Instagram, I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see one of the kids that I played soccer with in high school. He was a senior when I was a freshman, but we just kind of stayed in touch. And I saw that he was like the top intern at Northwestern Mutual, which was one of the companies that I had applied for. And this Northwestern Mutual internship was like the number one ranked finance internship in the US at the time. And I just wanted to hit him up and learn a little bit more about like his experience there. So I was like, hey, hey, B, like, would you like to grab some ice cream? Um, and I, I was, and he's like, and people always ask me why ice cream? And I say ice cream because coffee is sort of outdone. Everyone always asks for coffee. And then you also don't know if the other person drinks coffee or not. And then lunch as a broke college student can be expensive. And sometimes you can get that paid for you if they're, if they're nice enough on the other end and you're grateful for that. But if it's coming out of your pocket, it can get a little expensive. So I was like, ice cream is cheap. Um, no one says no to ice cream and it's a sweet, right? So, so I asked for ice cream and we just met up at a local um, ice cream place and we we're just talking and learning about his experience. He knew that I was a go-getter. I would put in the work. So he pretty much vouched for me. And I believe it's usually a two or three interview process. This was already two or three weeks into the internship. He vouched for me. I had one interview. I walked into the interview. They're like, this is just sort of a formality. We love B. Um, you basically have the internship. Um, you just have to pass the test. And I was like, okay, so this is how it works. And <laughs> so like once I realized that, I was like, oh, okay, how can I be more strategic about all these other things that I'm doing? So that was how I got my first Fortune 500. My next one was at Lockheed Martin. And what I did with that was I literally went to my career, um, my career coach's office every single week for like 10 weeks, literally every week, just saying, hey, can we have a conversation? Hey, can we talk about a resume? Hey, can I talk about my career? Just random things. And I think, I think career services gets a bad rep. Are there some not so great um, officers there? Probably. But I think they get a bad rep because a lot of students' expectations are like, hey, I'm going to go to one meeting and I should end up with an internship. And like that's just not how it works. Um, they need to build up a rapport with you. They need to understand who you are. They need to be they need to understand that the name that they're putting their name on is someone that's reputable. And I don't think students realize that. And so that's why I went to him literally every single week for pretty much a whole semester. We were during this whole time after probably like five meetings with him, he was like, okay, we're going to get an, you an internship. And we were, we were applying everywhere. And again, I wasn't getting any callbacks. And it got to the point where he's like, what the heck is going on? Is there like a like a, a criminal with your name or something that your name is just getting rejected from the ATS system or something. So he said, okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, Lockheed Martin, they have a co-op program that works with UCF. So they have an office on campus. I'm going to go to the director and just tell him that he needs to hire you. And literally within two weeks, I had two interviews, uh, missed out on the first one, uh, but it got the second one. So that's how I got my second one. And that just literally just brute force I mean, I have two more, but I think the, uh, the one that a lot of people want to hear from is my last Fortune 150 internship. And that one was with the Hartford. Again, I was trying to find my way back up to Connecticut um, for the summer. And I didn't even know about this, but I guess internship recruiting supposedly happens in the fall, like the beginning of the fall for next summer. And I didn't know that this was December. And I was looking for an internship for that next summer. And I was like, okay, I'm early. I'm going to get an internship. I was really late. I was extremely late. And I started doing research online and I was like, oh, wait, I'm really late. So I need to find a way to, to make this work. So I, w I get randomly get an email from my student um, email saying like, hey, this is the mass organization, which is like the multicultural organization on campus. We're hosting an exclusive career fair before the big one. There are some employers that are going to come. And I was like, okay, this sounds cool. I go to it, I dressed up, and I saw a booth for the Hartford. And I knew about the Hartford because insurance is sort of Connecticut's name to fame. 
And the Hartford is the city next to where I grew up. So I was like, okay, this is cool. Let me connect on that. And I'm just talking to her and she wasn't even there recruiting for that internship. She was recruiting for their office down in Florida. And I was like, hey, I'm from Connecticut. Like, do you know if they have any opportunities up there for the summer? And she goes, well, I know it's kind of late. Typically they're done recruiting by December, but let me shoot them an email. So I was like, okay, great. Thank you so much. I gave her my resume. I followed up with her. And the next thing I know, I am talking to the director of the finance internship program at the Hartford. And she's like, hey, we would love to interview you. We, I think either someone had just dropped from the spot, from an internship spot, or they were thinking about creating this one internship in the real estate space. And I was like, hey, I'll do it. Let me know what I need to do for an interview. I would love to. And then I remember I was headed to the lake um, with my girlfriend down in Florida. And I had just gotten my acceptance letter from Lockheed to keep going for the next semester for the uh, co-op. And then I'm on my phone. I get a random phone call from an 860. Usually I don't pick this up because it's usually spam. And I was like, sure, let me just pick it up. Pick it up. And they're like, hey, um, this is blah, blah, blah from the Hartford. Uh, I would love to um, let you know that we would love to have you on for the summer. And I was like, I was like in shock because I did not think I was going to get it because this was in like January or February. So that by that time, it's like all those internships are taken. And I had one interview and it was, it was a personality interview and it wasn't even like technical or anything like that. So I get my internship offer and then she tells me that it's paid $20 an hour. And I'm like, $20 an hour? I have never been paid this in my life, right? Like the most I was making, I mean, I think Lockheed was paying me like $13 an hour, which was good. Um, but $20 an hour, that's like next level. That was rich um, when it comes to college students. So that was, that was absolutely amazing. But I got that because I asked a question. And I think students don't ask that question, especially when it comes to, to the career fairs. Our next guest is Christine Cruz Vergara, the Chief Education Strategy Officer at Handshake. Handshake is the number one way college students get hired. With more than 500,000 employers in over 1,200 college and universities using this platform, it really is no wonder over 8 million college students are using Handshake. Many companies are having trouble filling skilled positions, and here we ask Christine how Handshake can help. I think it can be addressed a couple of different ways. And I'll actually talk about a new form of partnership that we've started to see pop up even more that I think is really interesting and is quite promising. More employers are recognizing that if there is a skills shortage of some of the types of skills that they're looking for, they are partnering with institutions to actually offer classes and short programs, right? Micro credentials around some of those things. We've seen Netflix do it. We've seen Amazon do it, right? And some of that is a really great way to actually bring together education and industry Mm -hmm. into an even smarter sort of partnership of what Mm -hmm. that can look like. And it's a fantastic pipeline for students to then go into some of those organizations or to be quite qualified to go into other organizations, Mm -hmm. right? And I think we hopefully will see more of the sort of public-private partnerships sort of happen with institutions, especially with companies who have the money, who have the opportunity to be able to do some of those things. I think Handshake's role in that too is really around the skills piece. So as we move forward into the future, we're certainly starting to ask a lot of questions around where might we, as our ecosystem and our scale is so large, where might we be the most useful? Mm -hmm. Is it in helping students to identify what skills they might be missing based on the job descriptions and the types of opportunities that we see on our platform? And then perhaps maybe helping to direct them to places where they can gain some of those skills. Many of the institutions that we partner with offer courses or Mm -hmm. offer short programs on some of these things in addition to boot camps or other places. But I don't know that students necessarily always know that that exists or where they should go for that. So we're already a marketplace. How might we be able to help students identify their gap and then actually fill that gap, right? And then of course, we are the place where students would then identify and showcase that they now have this skill so that employers can actually search for them. 
Yeah. Those pieces are already built into our system. That's already yeah, happening. That's so how do we amplify that more? So I think for us, that is really where we would like to focus a little bit more time and energy as we move into the future um, to sort of see how do we help with that component so that it really is a partnership across all parties oh. versus just one or the other. Our next guest is George McGarren, founder and president of the McGarren Group, executive headhunting and branding experts. George shares with us his expert job seeking advice from the perspective of someone with 30 years of recruiting experience. So there's probably three things that I could say that there were, and these are tips that are useful for pretty much the, the whole sort of period of your career. And these are the same tips. I mean, like we're dealing with people that are, that are running these large, just gigantic global companies and the tips actually apply to them as well as as well as it's some, as somebody coming out of school, right? So there's one thing, and I and I don't know if folks know this, but there's a if you apply to a job online, there's I think statistically there's a two percent response rate. So on the other side, if you you know there's an eighty percent chance that you'll find your first role, your second role, your third role from six degrees of separation, right? So like if you if you have a you know you have a choice, you need to think about the eighty percent piece of it. And that, that gets down to, to and, and Austin kind of had reached upon this, which I think is, that's why sort of I'm in love with his advice, because it's good advice. You, you should t- you should get a piece of paper or your phone or a computer and just write down the who, the what, the why, the how, the when, the where, right? And, and think about that six degrees of separation, because it's literally, it's the best way to, to sort of find a job, your first job. I, when you guys were kids, I don't know if this was my experience, but when I was 13 or 14, my first job, I told my, but my dad's like, you need to get a job. Right. So I'm like, okay. Right. So I knocked in a neighbor, I, I knocked in a neighbor's door, you know, and I knocked in his door and then the neighbor sent me to somebody else, you know, five blocks away and then somebody else. And next thing you know, I had a job at like a deli. Right. You know, and that, that technique, believe it or not, works really well for somebody out of school. You can do that, by the way. So let's say you, let's say you've got friends at college or university that maybe they were a year or two ahead of you, right? You can, I mean, really easily. You can go on LinkedIn, you can go on Facebook, see where they ended up, right? Call them up and say, "Hey, listen, like I'm about to graduate. Can you make an introduction for me? You know what I mean? With your boss, you can piggyback off a lot of people. If you've got brothers and sisters, right? People in your town and some of these sales organizations, they call it the power base. Um, but you need to think about your power base. I need to think about, you know, who you can talk to, right? Because somebody for sure that, you know, you know, is able to get your next, is your first, first or next or, you know, last job, right? So first thing is you need to network with the best of them. Um, The second thing is keep in mind when you network, and this is, I think, one of the mistakes that the kids and younger people make is that they, they stick to the technology and they're not worried about the face to face, right? If you, let's say you make, you want to make $50,000 a year, right? And you're going to, and you're going to work at a place for three or four years. That's literally, it's a $200,000 problem, you know, and uh, you're not going to solve a problem by sending an awesome text, you know, it's just, it's just not going to happen, right? So you need to get in front of people. So I, my recommendation is technology to FaceTime. And I, and I say FaceTime in quotes, as in like, you need to get in front of people. So use technology to do some of the, the back end things, but then get like your end game should be to get in front of that person face to face, right? And then I would say the first thing is if you get an email from somebody, I would push for at least a phone call if you can. Personality is what gets you, you know, sort of the face to face. Usually it's the personality um, that people buy. Right. So but the second thing is just like so technology to FaceTime. And I would I would say the the third thing is this is a big, big problem with younger people is that they think that they're like the only candidate in the world. And like they go out the night before and you need to show up engaged and very, very well prepared. And you have to study like who you're talking to, the company culture, who works there, what problem they're trying to solve, because they're like, this isn't, it's not a charity, as, you, as both you guys know, right? Like companies hire. And sometimes as a younger person, and when I was younger, I just thought everything was like a charity, right? You know, where it's like, oh, I'll just walk in and they, they need to talk to me and they just need to hire 10 people. And how much does it pay? And right, so you have to you have to show up and you have to figure out, okay, wait, they're, they're, they're going to pay me like 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand, 70 grand to solve what to solve a couple of problems. What what problems are they really trying to solve? And you need to take a more mature look at it. And uh, those are three tips, right? So just, don't, you know, don't let technology or, you know, don't just think you're going to apply it to a $200,000 or it's just not going to happen. You just apply things online. Number two is, you know, make sure that yeah, six degree separation technology to FaceTime, right? Face to face. And the last thing is just to make sure you're prepared, engaged and and you study every opportunity because that, that one might opportunity might turn into it, it might turn into something like the most amazing career life event, you know, that you're ever going to have. And you just don't know until you you give your best. 
Up next, we have Michelle Weiss, who has written the book everyone in the college and career space is talking about. Long life learning, preparing for jobs that don't even exist yet. Given that the first people who will live to be 150 have already been born, we will all need to be prepared to not only work longer, but we will also need to know how to retool for the inevitable evolution of jobs requiring us to be long life learners. So we asked Michelle, how will we do that? I found it so helpful, even even if it's hard to fathom and even if there's this kind of like great repulsion, right? Of like, oh my God, 150 years. Like, I don't want to live 150 yeah, right. years. I don't want to work that long. <laughs> right. I don't want to work 100 years. Um, <laughs> there's this, this is kind of like real, right. right? Real revulsion that kind of emerges. But I found it such a hugely helpful mental model to just sort of snap me out of attention, you know, just snap me out of that kind of inertia and paralysis of hearing all the different kinds of statistics flying around the future of work. But to really start to figure out, okay, what does a life, a work life that's going to last 100 years look and feel like, right? And if we just think about today, how hard it is to navigate a single job change, Mm -hmm. how in the world will we do this 20 or 30 times over? And the reason why it's easy to extrapolate just to those numbers is early baby boomers today are already having an average of 12 job changes by the time they retire. So for the rest of us who still have to remain in the workforce, we can only kind of bump that up at least to 20, right? We can, it's easily imaginable, even if we don't believe that we'll live to be 150 years old. As we think about how we navigate, how we fund that, how we how we make this easier for ourselves. My real focus here and the focus on those learners that you allude to is let's just stop thinking about work and think about workers and the fact that actually all of us are going to have to be these working learners, somehow juggling working and learning because two, four year degree on the front end of a hundred year life, it just seems insufficient right? Or inadequate to sustain us, especially as technology is changing so rapidly. So how do we, first of all, home in on the pain points that people are just coming up against today? And my lens is trying to think about the bottom quartile of our labor market, people with only a high school degree who are not earning a living wage and, and, and trying to surface the constraints and barriers and obstacles that are getting in the way of their advancement. And so it's really important for me to just elevate their voices because then it becomes quite clear how the problems seem to coalesce around career navigation, wraparound support services, more precise educational opportunities, and more integrated learning opportunities while they're earning a living, and then more fair and transparent hiring practices. That's where so many of these deep, in, you know, in-depth interviews kind of led is, oh my gosh, all the conversations keep revolving around these five main principles that mm-hmm. we need to solve for. We highly recommend if you want to learn more about those five main principles, grab Michelle's book. It's excellent. Our next guest is Madeline Mann from Self Made Millennial. Madeline is a career strategist and has been featured on Bloomberg, Forbes, New York Times, and more. She has a popular YouTube channel, Self Made Millennial, where she puts out rapid fire career and job search advice. Such great advice. Here we talk about the importance of the cover letter and how to write one with three easy steps. Madeline just gives you the recipe. So you want to hear this. So I would say for the cover letter, that one I really like because a lot of people will tell you, don't write a cover letter. No one reads them. And that is true about 50% of the time. It's a coin flip whether or not someone's going to read your cover letter. But if writing a cover letter that 50% time gets someone to then call you, I believe it's worth it. Mm-hmm. Right. And does anybody ever say, I can't believe they wrote a cover letter? <laughs> you know, it's never a negative, right? Unless you don't write a good cover letter, right? That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So you might as well write one. Yes. And so I am someone who reads cover letters. So that's why Mm -hmm. I'm also especially passionate about them. But my cover letter formula, I believe in the title, it says three-step easy cover letter formula because it is extremely easy easy and it really shouldn't take you very much time and it still packs a punch. So what that formula is, is the first sentence is, 
what kind of professional you are. Just out the gate, I am a, a talent development manager at Inspire, and I have built programs for over 500 points or something. So and a quantifiable right. second, experience right out of the gate? You use a number or a measure of some kind? Numbers are always good. If you can't get a number in the first line, that's okay. So yeah, I think it's just, yeah, people love to see numbers. I would say then the second part is naming an accomplishment or two that is specifically pertaining to the job description. Right. So I remember when I was applying for HR coordinator roles, I said things like, I've built a buddy program for new hires and I have been the manager of all of employee files for, yeah, exactly, for 150 employees or whatever it was. And those are things that were showing up in that HR coordinator role where it's like, okay, this person has done these things or this is also a great moment if you are maybe one of those applicants who isn't uh, someone who has had this experience in the past that you name these things from organizations, student organizations or other things that you've done where you're kind of connecting these skills that may be on a resume, they might not immediately pop out as, okay, this is the exact same type of job as what they're applying to. Right. Right. Speaking of resumes, I don't want to step out of yeah, the don't, cover letter yeah. of tips, but when you have, we don't want to get away from that. But a quick question, do you read the resume? I mean, honestly, like all of it, I mean, especially if they have a good cover letter, do you just kind of confirm things with the resume or just go to LinkedIn? So I start with the resume, then yeah. I go to LinkedIn. I usually go to LinkedIn almost immediately. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that is extremely important. We have heard that from a lot of hiring managers, honestly. So listeners, Mm -hmm. your LinkedIn is important. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. It is. It should be on your application. And then I'll go to the cover letter. And if I'm on the edge about the LinkedIn and resume, the cover letter generally pushes me over the edge one way or another. In one direction or another. Wow. Interesting. See, another good reason to have a cover letter. So you're on number three. Yeah, so the cover letter. (laughs) The third part of the cover letter is say something about why you're interested in that company. Mm -hmm. And- Do not overthink this. So it could be as simple as, and I'm very interested in working at your company because my values align very closely with your mission to bring healthcare to underserved communities. Mm -hmm. Boom, done. Like that is, that's, Right. And honestly, yeah. it is so crazy how many people do just send their resume out there and they don't take time to get to know what kind of company they're applying to. So don't be that person and take the time to understand what company you're applying to and target your cover letter and resume to that company. Next, we asked Madeline how to get your digital resume noticed by the company you want to work for. What I recommend is to never apply and then just wait. I recommend sending an email or a LinkedIn message to either someone in the company or try to find out who the hiring manager is and let them know you applied. Right. So the way I do this is I go on LinkedIn and I see who works at the company and I see if anyone is a first or second degree connection. Mm -hmm. And if there's second degree connection, I look to see who we're connected by and I hope that it's someone who I legitimately have some sort of relationship with. And I'll either ask them to introduce me to that person or sometimes I'll just go ahead and in my message say, hey, you know, I saw you are connected to Meg. I was Mm -hmm. on her podcast and we have a great relationship and I wanted to reach out because I just applied to a job at your company and I was hoping you know, my resume might get lost in the shuffle. So I was hoping you'd help like pass it along or something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's great. I heard this LinkedIn tip from Wayne Breitbart, who you also know. And he was saying that you can search in an area, say you went to USC, you can see if anybody in in that company went to USC. And and that that gives you something in common. Hey, I'm a UCSC grad too. (laughs) Yeah, or whatever. Yes, that's magic. Absolutely. And our 10th and last guest is Robin Manlet. Managing Partner and Practice Leader of the executive search firm Wick Kiefer. Robin co-authored an amazing book, College Admissions from Application to Acceptance, Step by Step. As the former dean of admissions at Stanford, she knows a thing or two about college admissions. Here we ask Robin what an overpackaged student looks like and how college counselors can help. 
there are a lot of great independent counselors and anyone can overpackage, including parents or students themselves. And so in the book that Christine and Vandevelde and I wrote, we described an overpackaged student as someone who sounded more like an adult than a young person Mm -hmm. and who lacked authenticity to the point where that became obvious to an admission officer. It's one of those, you know, you know it when you see it things. I did college counseling for a year and it it is a very challenging job, but I think there is a line that you can cross where what is being produced by the student is no longer truly theirs. And the admission people can definitely spot that, right? Like a mile away. (laughs) You know, I'm sure there are people they miss, but... That's an awfully big chance and probably not the message as grownups we want to be sending to students in this process that who they are themselves is not enough and it has to be enhanced. We asked Robin, what is it that selective colleges and universities are looking for? You know, they're looking for a range of things depending on their own institutional culture and mission. So what's important is for the student to really do their homework and come to know each college. And I think when students do that, it's more clear where there is a fit. So Mm -hmm. I was thinking, for example, I used to work at Pomona College in Claremont, California. Mm -hmm. So you know there are five undergraduate colleges all basically across the street from one another, and each has a very different persona. So Pomona College, where I worked, identifies itself as a premier liberal arts institution that is a close-knit and diverse community of accomplished scholars, scientists, entrepreneurs, and artists um, who are passionate about making a difference in the world. And it it stresses a comprehensive curriculum that's strong across the board and states quite directly you know, we seek the brightest, most talented, most driven students from all over the world. So I think that's a pretty good signal to students about what they need to be like and eager to engage in, what kind of a community that creates. Um, Claremont McKenna is renowned for expertise in economics and government and emphasizes the integration of leadership and innovation. And CMC says that they teach leaders leaders, how to make an impact and succeed in today's world. So again, a very different message that is coming from that college. And, And it goes down the list, right? Every college, most colleges, I should say, are pretty clear about what their mission is and culture is. And, you know, it's never been as easy as it is today to really learn in depth about a college because websites now are just so rich. We next asked Robin about the changing landscape of college and universities with the economic pressures and challenges they are facing. You know, I think the landscape is a is a rapidly changing one. We look at the number of institutions that are merging or closing, and I think that that it it takes a lot for an institution to be successful in this time. But those that are successful are both offering outstanding educations and they are fortunate to be well endowed. And so I think those institutions will be surviving. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. We certainly enjoyed going back and listening to some of these amazing guests. We want to thank everyone that took the time to join us on the podcast this season, the last two seasons, and for all of our listeners for supporting us. It really means a lot. We are looking forward to season four, which seems crazy that we are already on a fourth season, but here we are. (laughs) Until then, be well, everyone. And this has been an Academic and Career Advising Services production. 